Welcome to the Tripod, where we break down every NRL game every week from a punting perspective. This is Season Preview 2021 Part 2 of 2, so you hopefully have already caught Part 1, where I was joined by Clarkie from Clarkie's Rugby League column, as I am again for Part 2. We broke down all the sides that were in the top eight last year and talked about how we thought they'd go this year. Hope you enjoyed it. Most of the top eight spots for this year that we're predicting are taken up by those same sides. In fact, for me, there's just one remaining, so you'll find out in a minute who I'm giving my final top eight spot to. But while these sides are not the flashiest in the competition, the sides that were outside the eight last year, there's still some very interesting topics. There's some sides that I think that no one's talking about that could go really well. Not only do I have another couple of long shot futures plays, I even have my first regular NRL round one best bet that I'm going to give out a week early on a team I really like. That I think there's a line that's available now that may not be available in a week from now when I do my NRL Round 1 preview. So I hope you enjoy it. If you recall, we jump into the teams from 9th to 16th last year, which means we begin with Clarkie's very own Gold Coast Titans. We gain Patrick Herbert, David Fafida, Herman S.A.S.A., Sam McIntyre, and Tino Fawasumale. I'm going to say it wrong. Big Tino. We lose Jai Arrow, Shannon Boyd, Bryce Cartwright, Dale Copley, Ryan James, Keegan Hipgrave, and Nathan Peets. Overall, I've given us an A for our recruitment. Um, I do think the only sort of um, negative people could have is the fact we have paid, I would say, significant overs for young guns like Dave Rafita and Tino. Um, but what it has done is put us in a position to make the top eight, and it's put us in a genuine position to say this is the best Titans team we've probably seen since 2010 when they made the preliminary final. I am very excited to be a Titans fan this year. I think Justin Holbrook is a proven winner from his premiership in the Super League. I think he can replicate maybe not that success immediately with the Titans, but I do think the success of a premiership in the Super League can translate to the Titans making the top eight this year at a very minimum. Um, they did finish the year 5-0, and o, which is a huge confidence booster. But I will say this. For every positive I've just said for the Titans, great signings, finish the year strong, it doesn't matter because this is a fresh season. It doesn't matter that the Panthers only lost one last year. Same as it doesn't matter that the Titans are on a five-game win streak. This is a new season, and it doesn't matter who you sign. It's how they play. Um, and so I do think the Titans are being overhyped in regards to that. Um, but with all that being said, um, I'm going to follow my gut instinct, and I do think the Titans will finish within the top eight this year. I've also got them top eight, and I also agree that maybe they are overhyped. Now, um. It looks like a beautiful sunset in Canberra. I don't know if there's anything you can do with your blinds. It's like it might wig people out. There's like real bright sunshine across your face. But I'll let you see if you can deal with that. But um, we all know about the recruits that the Titans have brought in this year. I think you touched on a great point being it's not just about the recruits. It's the buzz. It's the energy because they got confidence that they have a squad that can do something this year. And no doubt about it, the expectation within this playing group is going to be to play finals footy this year. However, to me, like with the, with the hype, it does put a lot of pressure on them, and it does mean there may not be value from a betting perspective. And look, I look at their squad, and I guess you'll agree on this point. Like, look, I don't think they're better than Parramatta. But I think your typical person this year thinks the Titans will go better than Parramatta, for example. Mm. Uh, now, we disagree on this point, but I think that like, well, sorry, Raiders, we both also would say will finish higher than the Titans in our in our you know estimation. Yep. But I look at the Knights, and I think that's a quite a fair comparison between the Knights roster and the Titans roster, you got second-year head coach Holbrook and O'Brien. You got a gun fullback, whether it be Kalen Ponga or Brimson, who's had off-season uh, surgery. You got not the most scary kind of outside backs with the centers and wingers, um, which is why they're maybe not in the higher echelon. You know, uh, the Titans brought in for Fida, the Knights brought in for Zell. Yes, the Titans also brought in Fasul Malaawi, but uh, you'd have to agree that the Knights had a better forward pack probably to build on. And you look at the halves. You've got Fogarty and Ash Taylor versus Pierce. And, and man, I can't really separate. Like, I, I don't re- I'd like someone to explain to me why the Titans are any stronger than, let's say, Newcastle. And if you can't say they're a lot stronger, maybe it is just a vibe and an energy thing. But apart from the fact that, there, of course, there could be turmoil and injuries always change things. And the biggest X factor of all would be if a, if a certain C. Smith ended up joining this Titan side and you can wrap it and say if you think that's any chance or what you've heard. But I think roughly I have those two teams on the same level. So I've got them right next to each other on the ladder with the Knights seventh and the Titans rounding out my top eight. 
Yeah, I don't think they're a chance of getting Cameron Smith. Uh, but one thing I will say, given this is a punting podcast, from a punting perspective, being a passionate Titans fan, um, obviously I watch us every week. And typically we do struggle when we are the favorites heading into games. I've never really crunched the data on that. Um, but from my perspective, having watched every Titans game for since however long you want to go back, we have always struggled when we come into a game with expectation to beat that team. And then you factor in this year, we're coming into a season with expectation. Um, I would be a little bit cautious betting on the Titans, at least to start the year until we see what they're made of um, in 2021. But we move on to the team that finished 10th last year, the New Zealand Warriors. They gained Bailey Searin and Ewan Aitken, Marcelo Montoya, Sean O'Sullivan, Adam Fanua Blake, Ben Murdoch, Masilla, and Kane Evans. But they do lose a host of um, talent there. They lose Gerard Beal, Adam Blair, Lachlan Burr, Patrick Herbert, Adam Kieran, Tane Milne, Ignatius Parsi, and Isaiah Papali'i. But overall, I will give the Warriors an A for their recruitment. I would say between them, the Titans, and the Rabbitohs, I would say those three teams have recruited the best of this offseason. Um, you could convince me either one um, in any order because the fact is they've all done such a magnificent job. Um, but in particular, I do love the signings in their forward pack. I do think Ben Murdoch Masilla. Adam Fanua Blake and Bailey Sirena will have a huge impact. Um, the fact that Ben Murdoch Masilla is playing on an edge in the back row, I think that makes him so much more dangerous. We saw how dangerous he was in the trial, but the whole reason why I'm so pumped to watch the Warriors this year, Chanel Harris DeVita and Cody Nicarima are both halves that they need space and they need time. And the reason they need that is because they really do take on the line and they take the ball right to the line before they make that decision of, Am I passing or am I showing and going here? I mean, it is simple footy, but we do see a lot of halfbacks like Mitchell Pierce. They might set the back line before, and then they're distributing to the 5 8 and then that play is going to unfold. Whereas halves like Cody and CHT, at least from my observations last year, take it straight to the line, and when they have, we're on the when they're on the back foot of um, Fanua Blake uh, in particular, I see their forward pack laying this platform, Jacob, where they get over the top of their other team, and then that's going to give Nicarima and CHT more time and space to decide: is there a gap in the line for me to pick? Am I taking the ball straight to the line here and hitting Sirenin or Ben Murdoch Masilla with a short ball? Am I going to throw a cutout ball right now to you and Aitken, who we've seen so dangerous? So I do think there's a lot of options for the Warriors this year. It is. All going to start on the back of their forwards laying a magnificent platform. And I do think they return to finals football. However, I, they are one of those teams I have just inside the eight or just out, just inside or just outside the eight. Sorry. If they finished eighth, I wouldn't be sub, uh, surprised. If they finished ninth, I also wouldn't be surprised. So that's where I've got the Warriors. I have them a little lower. This is the first team we're speaking about that has a new coach this season. So I'll come out and say... Nathan Brown wouldn't have been my pick. Uh, no. Maybe it's just the way that he left Newcastle and the way that he kind of lost the playing group kind of left a bit of taste in my mouth, like just yep. how, I, how I saw that unfold. But it's also really hard, even if, you know, even if he is the man for the job, like can he elevate this squad immediately? When you, know, when, when you consider last year, they played with amazing resilience and spirit and they finished the year so strong and a couple of close losses. If they'd gone the other way, this team would have made the finals, which would have been just about a miracle. Um, so it's not as if this club needed a culture change, where if, if a club's got like a really bad culture, a coach can come in and change it. You can get an increase in performance a bit more quickly that way. The other thing is, did, has he got off on the wrong foot by denying his players the opportunity to represent the Moldy all-star squad? Because I understand he's coming in, laying down the law, like, the, you know, this club is the most important, this season's important. But let's be honest, the Warriors aren't going to be a contender this year. The Indigenous game is so meaningful to those players. Now, I haven't heard anything. I don't know if you have, but I just wonder how those players felt, whether that's a good way to kind of build up a bond with them. But the other part of the season that will take a toll, I think, is no home games again, or at least no home games in sight. We don't know how that's going to play out. Of course, they did really well last year. But it's a lot to go through it again. And it's like, if nothing else, even if they play well in Australia, you losing the disadvantage to the opponent that used to be them traveling to New Zealand. So that's obviously like, just makes every game a little bit easier for the opponent, the ones that should have been in New Zealand anyway. So as for the quality of the squad, it's definitely an improvement. You talked about the recruitment. And not for, let's not forget the players they lost 
because of COVID that went home for family reasons, like Fusatua, Mamalo, like they're back for the full squad. AFB, I think, is one of the signings of the year. I shed a tear when I heard the news about RTS that he'll be leaving after the year. Again, I want to say, you know, pour one out for RTS. I'm grateful for the number of phenomenal seasons that we have gotten to witness, and I expect another one this year as he signs off. Look, if Nathan Brown proves me wrong, I think he can get him to the fringe of the top eight, as you suggest. But I have them on the outside, actually, more like 13th. The interesting thing for me, I suppose, um, is that Nathan Brown, he wouldn't have been the choice for me, and I agree with you there, um, but he is perceived as a rebuild coach. Right. Um, and how I look at that is the Warriors aren't necessarily a team that needs rebuilding, seemingly. They do have somewhat of a roster. Um, but then the flip side of that, and I think the way that a lot of people aren't looking at it, is they actually do need a rebuild. Um, we've seen that with a lot of the signings they've made. Um, but also the fact they've only played finals football in 2018, um, and they were eliminated in the first round against the Panthers. It could have been 2017, 2018. I can't remember. But um, And then dating back from that, it's been a while since they've played finals. So realistically, um, I don't agree with the signing of Nathan Brown, but... Um, they are somewhat in a rebuild phase, so therefore it does make sense there. Shall we move on to the team that came 11th last year? Let's do it. Okay, perfect, guys. We have the West Tigers. Now, I think they have recruited quite well. They have signed Dane Laurie, who looked awesome in the trial the other day. I think he scored two tries. Stefano Uto Aikamanu. Um, I can't pronounce this young man's name yet, but uh, his name is uh, Tuki, something Tuki. Um, and they actually traded Kane Bradley... Uh, to the Cowboys for him. I will get his name um, before we finish this segment. Um, they recruited Joe Alphahen, Gowie, James Tamo, and James Roberts. But they do lose uh, a fair bit of um, talent here. They lose Josh Alloye, Kane Bradley, Oliver Clark, Matthew Eisenhuth, uh, Robert Jennings, Benji Marshall, Chris Lawrence, Sam McIntyre, Josh Reynolds, Elijah Taylor, and Paul Momorowski. Now, the one positive for Tigers fans is a lot of the players they did lose were on large contracts, and so that is a positive sign moving into the future this year. Um, and I know that Dane Laurie, it does look like he's going to perform very well this year at fullback, um, but... We have to be realistic here. There are some more positives, such as young players coming in, um, Stefano Uta Kamano into the forward pack. Um, but then, you know, James Tamo is a fantastic leader. But I think I have to draw the line there at the positives for the club, and I still have them in the bottom four this year. Um, the reason being is, at the end of the day, their best half last year was Benji Marshall. Their best player overall was Harry Grant. And their best forward was Josh Aloye. And they've lost all three. Um, compile that the fact with that Michael Maguire, yes, he had success at South Sydney Rabbitohs, but he had a phenomenal roster. He doesn't have a Greg Inglis in this side. He doesn't have a Sam Burgess and Adam Reynolds. He has a halfback in Luke Brooks that, no offense, hasn't played, has never played finals. I mean, almost any other team would have booted him out of the door. Um, how many, I don't know how many seasons Luke Brooks had, um, but uh, it's been a few. And in that, in regards to that. Um, here we go. I'm getting it up on Wikipedia now. 2013, he debuted Jacob, and they haven't played finals with him. Uh, let's look at another team that is successful, such as the Roosters. Well, they booted Kyle Flanagan because they didn't make a grand final. Not make finals, didn't make a grand final. They booted him one year in. Um, and so Luke Brooks has been able to sort of hide under the radar for so long with the Tigers because the whole club as a whole has been mediocre. I think their board continues to make mediocre decisions and signings. Um, and I've, I've just got so much negative to say for the Tigers, unfortunately. And they're one of those clubs where there will be some positives. Um, and, and I feel bad because I, I was saying so much negative stuff about them last year. But I have to be realistic. I can't see them improving too much in 2021. I love how animated you've gotten with them. And um, I'm actually going to make the case why they can be better this year. And that's why I think if they're better than people think, they could be a team where we get value. Now, as always, they're lacking that bit of class. Like, it's the same story every year. And you talked about the board and the recruitment. They haven't had, like, a roster that has been in contention. I think they are on the longest finals drought of any of the NRL clubs. Now, the loss of Benji, you wouldn't think that would be a positive. And you talked about Luke Brooks. I'm going to plant my flag and say I think he has a good year. And I think the fact that Benji leaves and that Josh Reynolds is gone, it's given him now ownership. 
don't forget, I think he won halfback, Dally M halfback of the year, like two or three years ago. And I think it threw him off playing second fiddle last year. I actually think he can combine really well with Adam Dwayhe, who moves into 5'8". I like that move. And I love the pickup of Dane Laurie that you reference as well uh, at fullback. I think that could end up being one of the pickups of the season. That then allows you to play Moses and Bayer in the centers. But they got options there because they got Leilua and they signed Roberts. And they got a couple of other exciting young outside backs. You pick up two solid props in Tarmau and Offengawi, guys that have played rep level. Harry Grant leaves a massive hole, which you alluded to as well, which means it's a huge season for Jacob Little. Look, I think it'll be a tough year for them in the sense that they like somehow expect to make the finals and Madge like flogs them when they don't win and that can wear them out. But you know it's a fit team that fights hard. I'm not taking the piss here. I'm going to predict that they'll come ninth. (laughs) It took me a while to realize the uh, reference there. but So guys, that team for me in this part two preview that I think is going to come into the season quite underrated and actually surprise some people, although I don't have them in the eight, I have them exceeding expectations, is the West Tigers, and I've explained why there. Let's start with my best bet for round one. This is my first bet for 2021, my first bet on my own without Alex holding my hand for the tripod, and I'm going to take a double-digit underdog. I'm going to take the West Tigers in round one, playing the Canberra Raiders. The best price for the Tigers in round one is $1.92 plus 10.5. That's in sports bet other markets. In their regular line, they've got it $1.88, so four cents higher. It's also $1.90 for plus 10.5 on Ladbrokes and on Neds as well. For one thing, I think Maguire always has his teams coming in rock hard fit early in the year. And double digits is a lot of points to be copping early in the year. These teams aren't always exactly what you anticipate they're going to be. A lot of sides need to build in. And while I spoke about one of the strengths in the previous podcast of the Canberra Raiders being their depth, doesn't necessarily mean they've got the ultimate class to blow a side off the park as they learn to adjust to play without Johnny Bateman, Nick Kotrick. There's a lot of reasons for me to believe the West Tigers can make a good game of this. I say take the 10 and a half. I don't think it gets to 12, but I think there's a good chance when I do my round one preview next week, this line could be single digits. And I'm going to give you an interesting value futures play here. If you look on Top Sport, it's called the Minor Premiership Handicap. You're going to see that there, plus 19 points. And the price, $14 if you hit the top-up button. That's topped up from 13 So you can get 14 to 1. And it's basically a 16-horse race, of course. The 16 teams have all been given a different number of points handicap. So the West Tigers basically have to exceed expectations by more than any other team. I think they're in a good position to do that because they're predicted to win such a low number of games. Take a swing for the fences, and if they have a good year, and if they're knocking on the door for the eight, I think they're going to give us a run for our money with a chance to cash this bet with the West Tigers, plus 19 points in the Premiership Ladder Handicap. Yeah, look, I know you're speaking on Luke Brooks improving there, and I do agree with almost every other point you had there. Um, A lot of people do hit my inbox and say that they have the Tigers in the top eight, and their reasoning is Luke Brooks will have Luke Brooks, sorry, will have a fantastic year. Well, the facts are in 2017 and 2018 he was the Tigers Player of the Year. In 2018 he was the Dalian Halfback of the Year, and the Tigers did not make finals then. How much more higher is Luke Brooks' ceiling? Um, given, you know, if he's halfback of the year, Dalian halfback of the year, how much more can he really do to get the Tigers into the finals there? I know that the responsibility ultimately always falls on the halfback when a team doesn't do well, um, but I don't think he should cop the full brunt, um, the full brunt of why the Tigers aren't a successful club at the moment. As I said, that decisions, uh, that, that, that lies with their board. Their board has made some very questionable decisions over the year, released some very questionable players and signed some very questionable players. But we will move on to the 12th team now from last year. We, we move will, on yep. to the St. George Illawarra Dragons. They sign Andrew McCulloch, Jack Bird, Daniel Arvaro, and Poasa Farmacilli. They lose Ewan Aitken, Tyson Frizzell, James Graham, Jacob Host, Joe Loverdow, Tristan Saylor, and uh, Corbin Sims. So a fair bit of losses there. Probably the most notable being Tyson Frizzell, obviously. I do love the signing of Jack Bird. Um, I don't necessarily love the signing of Andrew McCulloch, um, especially considering that they have lost Cameron McInnes moving forward. Um, and I'm just going to be brutally honest here. The Dragons are getting the spoon this year. They looked atrocious last year. They looked atrocious in the trials. Um, There are not too many positives for this club at the moment. Obviously, signing uh, Hook Griffin 
um, Anthony Griffin there, that is somewhat of a positive. Um, but again, he was removed from the Panthers for personality issues and whatever went on behind the scenes there. And the Panthers were doing well. If you have a team that's doing crap, which a lot of people expect the Dragons to do this year, then he's going to have more personality issues. I don't love the fact he's made Ben Hunt the captain. Um, I don't think Ben Hunt should be the halfback. He should be the hooker in the modern game with the rules speeding up. I don't mind McCulloch there, but I would have rather Ben Hunt. Uh, one thing I don't agree with is Ben Hunt being the captain in this side. Ben Hunt needs to worry about his own form because his own form has been horrible for several seasons now. Um, Corey Norman, again, I know he will persist with him at 5'8", because he does have a history with him at the Broncos, and typically we've seen Hook Griffin favor more experienced halves at former clubs that he's coached at, but Jaden Sullivan needs to be there. They need to buy the bullet now, because Corey Norman isn't their future. He's not. They will. I, I can guarantee they will not re-sign him at the end of this contract, but Jaden Sullivan, they will, or they will try to. They cannot risk losing him. They need to look at this year, for me, the Dragons, as a rebuild year. They just need to be realistic about it. Even if they make the top eight, they are not winning a premiership this year. They need to throw in their young guns because they do have a, quite a few nice young signings, such as Pawasa Farmacili and players like Jaden Sullivan and Cody Ramsey. And there's a couple others there. The, uh, the Fian guy, FIA guy brothers, Max and Matt, they do have so many fantastic young players. Hook Griffin needs to trust in those players, trust in the future, and not come into 2021 expecting his team to perform to a premiership standard. Um, I've got them winning the spoon. Yeah, I will also come out and put a big question mark over how good of a coach Anthony Griffin is because there's a bit of a storyline that came out that he was let go so harshly from Penrith. There's also the stats that he's got a really good career career wins record in terms of the you know win-loss when he was at Brisbane and obviously when he was in that three seasons in Penrith. But my argument is those were above average teams that he was coaching, so they should have won more than half their games. And I don't buy the whole narrative that he did a fantastic job because I'm a punter and I watch those Penrith teams each week and I saw a lot of talent and I saw teams that were like among the premiership favorites every year that I feel didn't play to their potential. So he also seemed to get a lot of credit because a lot of players came through in his tenure. But again, like, does that prove he was a great coach because he blooded them or does it show he had talent to work with? And as to your point, now he doesn't have the same level of talent in a squad that he has to take over. Now, that's just my opinion. Again, I, you know, I can be proven wrong if uh, Griff does an, a great job. But I'll just you know, make, make that case there, let it be known. that That's how I look at it before the season. Um, another thing is they talk a lot about a great crop of juniors. And you mentioned a number of those guys that are coming through. I'm not going to pretend to be a good judge of like your club junior stocks. But kind of regardless of that, we're previewing season 2021. How many of those guys are going to make like a significant impact? Like it's a different story to say the Figo twins or whatever are the future and Jaden Sullivan. But in the very short term, does it help him win a lot of NRL games? I don't see it. I mean, Dufty, he's he's good and and, and his skill set's perfect for the new rules. you got Paul Vaughan and, and Tarek Sims are still rep level forwards. Zach Lomax could be a, a rep level outside back. I'm looking for positives here. I'll, I'll be cheering for Jack Bird to get back to his best. I hope he does, whether it's at center or moving into the middle. But overall, I can't see them improving on last year. And last year, they came 12th. And this year, they've lost Tyson Frizzell and McInnes brutally to a, to a season-long injury now. I agree. I have them 16th. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you said, you, we are searching for positives with the Dragons, which is a poor sign. Because when we look at clubs like the Rabbitohs and the Raiders, the positives are just there. We don't have to go searching for them. Um, one thing I will bring up with you is, would you agree that last year Tyson Frizzell was one of their best, if not their best player? Absolutely, yeah. Basically the leader okay. of their pack with Vaughn. Spot on. So he leaves. So the very next year, who is their next best player? I would say Cameron McInnes. Would you agree he's up the top right. as well? He yeah. leaves as well. So there's obviously, um, you know, if your captain and best player can't see a premiership in your future or even a path to finals and they're leaving, and in Tyson Frizzell's case, he's openly saying, I'm leaving to play finals, um, then there's an issue at the club. So uh, Dragons, I'm not expecting big things from this year. But we move on to the thir team that came 13th last year, the Manly Sea Eagles. They gained Josh Alloy A, Andrew Davey, Kieran Foran, Christian Tui Pulitau, um, Jason Saab, but they do lose Joel Thompson, Corey Waddell, Luke Metcalf, Danny Levi, uh, Brendan Elliott, and most notably, Adam Fanua-Blake. Now, I don't see Manly in the top eight this year, 
prior to Tom Trevojevic going down injured again and question marks over his fitness. I had them right on the verge. I had them ninth, uh, potentially slipping just in in eighth. Um, but the issue that I have with the Seagulls this year is they do not have an out-and-out out recognized number nine. Now, we just saw last year that with the, with the game speeding up, you need to have a strong hooker. I mean, look at the teams that came. I mean, well, let's go to the top six last year. Coruscant, Cameron Smith, Reid Marnie, Jake Friend, Josh Hodgson, Damian Cook. So the top six last year, we can all agree, are all fantastic hookers. And then you look at teams that were in the bottom six last year. Broncos, didn't have a recognized nine. Bulldogs, not a recognized nine. Cowboys, chopped and changed. Manly, where well, we're talking about them. And McInnes uh, for the Dragons. Again, chopped and changed in and out of the nine. So just by looking at the ladder last year, Jacob, we can agree that you can paint a picture. You need to have a strong nine there. And Manly don't have that. And that's why, unfortunately, I see them missing the nine. If I was Des Hasler, I know players like Nathan Peets aren't going to set the world on fire and they're not going to be, you know, fantastic premiership winning hookers for you, but they are an experienced hooker. Hooker. If I was him, I'd be picking up the phone to Nathan Peets or one of these other hookers that are available and saying, hey, come and have a one-year deal with us. I would have re-signed Danny Levi for a one-year deal if I was them because he's in reserve grade now. So um, it just doesn't make sense that they didn't look to have a solid hooker there. Cade Cust can do the job, but... Not well enough. I think they missed the eight. That is a really good point about the hooker because it's such an important position. And a couple of years ago, they had Api Korosau and they had Fayunu. And now they've got neither of them. And I don't know the ins and outs of the situation, but this is crazy that he's been stood down since 2019. Oh, and, yeah. it's, and, and and I'm pretty sure his salary cap is still tied up. It's kind of like a yep. Jack DeBellin situation with, with the policy there. And that's very hard on the club. And it's a hole they have not filled since they lost Korosau. And then you got, speaking of holes to fill, like this Turbo Hammy is a tragedy because on his day, he's as good as any player in the world to me. And I hate to use a term like this because, you know, players can be really unlucky with injuries, but it, you'd have to call him injury prone at this point. And it's very worrying. And even though, like, he could be back and firing after a month, how can you be sure? Because these injuries keep la- lingering and he keeps kind of redoing injuries, and you feel like, you know, there could be an imbalance there. And, it's, and you, I hate to say this as well, but you start to get nervous about the massive contract that he signed, which Manly absolutely had to offer. They had to move heaven and earth yes. to keep the Trebojevic brothers because of what they're capable of and what they bring to the club. But if he if he can never play like a full season again, because it's always getting his injury hampered, that's going to be a disaster, honestly. It's cool that Foran is back, but you want to talk about injury history. Um, Dylan Walker's back off injury, and I hope that he makes a difference. And Moses Sully on his day as a gun. Josh Schuster, I'm ex- Schuster. I'm excited yeah. to watch play in the Hus and uh, and Paseca. I think this kid, you know, can be anything in the forwards. But speaking of the forwards, Fanua Blake is there, you know, a bigger loss to a pack, you know. And and That's what fun. I noticed last year, Fanua Blake was out a game here or there, and Jake Trubojevic takes it on himself to carry even more workload and more burden, and then that's the, to the detriment of his own game where he gets so fatigued that he can't, you know, be more creative on the on the attacking yep. side of the ball. So that hurts, and that's a that's a load that he's going to have to carry again. And all in all, if I knew that Turbo came back and fired for the final 20 games of the season, I'd have him getting into the eight. Since I don't know that, I got him 11th this year. Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly praying for the absolute best for Tom Trebojevic there. But we'll move on to 14th now, the North Queensland Cowboys. So they gained Javid Bowen, Kane Bradley, Michael Bell, um, Helam Lukey, Griffin Neem, and Lachlan Burr. A lot of depth signings there. They lose John Asiata, Gavin Cooper, Tom Opacek, uh, Daniel Russell. Uh, again, I forgot to find out this young gun's name, so I will do that now. They lose the young gun they traded for Bradley to the Tigers. Um, Tukey and Garrett Smith. So overall, I think they have lost more talent than they've gained. Uh, that young man's name is Tukamia Simpkins. I probably didn't pronounce the first name wrong there, but um, he's a big unit. And that, that could be a big loss for them in the future, given he's only 19 years old, already 192 centimeters and 105 kegs. So um, could be a big loss for them moving into the future. But yeah, I don't see the Cowboys doing too well this year. Um, I know they have made the signing of Todd Payton, which should help correct some things in attack. But as you touched on earlier when we spoke about the coaches, putting in new attacking strategies and structure does take time. My evidence to this is Anthony Seabold trying to put in his new attacking structure to the Broncos last year, and it didn't work. And that's because it doesn't always work. What worked for him at the Rabbitohs 
didn't work for him at the Broncos. And that's how it is team to team. What works for Todd Payton at the Warriors might not work at the Cowboys. And I understand people are going to make the argument, oh, but Tamalolo will average 200 metres. Tamalolo is a beast. Yeah, he's averaged 200 metres the last uh, since 2018. He's averaged 200 metres a game. Doesn't mean they're making finals. How much more can he do? Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I think for Cowboys fans, they are probably around the bottom four this year. Um, I do think they're one of those teams where their ceiling is the top eight. They could creep just in. But I think looking at it from a realistic perspective, they are a bottom eight team this year. I agree with you as well. I will not fault Todd Payton, the job he did with the Warriors last year. That's fantastic. But let me just say this, right? So they lost two games for the COVID break. They came back. They knew they'd have to stay in Australia. They won two of the next four, mind you, underdogs in all of them. And then they sacked Stephen Kearney. And to me, there's still more to that story because he wasn't doing that bad. But then Payton comes in, does a great job for the final 14 games. We talk about the spirit that the Warriors played with, right? Right. And what does he get? A four-year deal to come and co- head coach the Cowboys after coaching less than one full season as a head coach. Now, I just have to say, didn't we see Anthony Seabold, who you just referenced before? He had a great debut, one season, 2018, Coach of the Year in South, and Brisbane throwing the kitchen sink to get him for four years and regretted it in under 18 months. And so, removed the most winning premiership coach of all time in Wayne Right. Bennett. Exactly. So I don't know, like, but that's just my concern from the outside. I don't know, you know, the references about the man, the interview process that he went through. Like, regardless, even if uh, Peyton does a great job, as you said, like, how quickly does he turn around? I think it's the defense that needs the most work as well for them. And then a common theme that we see among the team that struggles is the contracts. And you've got players that are on really big money that aren't playing up to that level. And there's a question mark for me on these two million dollar men in Valentine Holmes and Michael Morgan. And I know what they're capable of. And if the cows are to make the eight, those two players have to be at their best. They got a third million dollar man who I know is worth every penny. And I expect that. But he plays, Tal Malola, that is, of course, who plays that well every year. So it's not like he can go to another level. Now, there's talk that they might use him differently, play him less minutes. To me, that doesn't kind of make them better or worse. Like if he plays a few less minutes, they'll be probably a little bit higher quality and he'll, you know, he'll last a little bit longer. But if you play more minutes, he's on the field for longer. So either way, what I always say about the Cowboys is they need other forwards to step up alongside Tamalolo, especially if he's going to be off the field a little bit more. Now, they've got some exciting points to hammer. Obviously, I still rate Scott Drinkwater and I think he'll do well yeah. in the halves there. Robson will take advantage of tied forwards in the middle. As Ruben Cotter well, potentially playing Ruben at block as well. That's well. another one. Right, so you've got these middles that, that can make a difference. But as I mentioned, I think forwards is a bit weak. Uh, defense is a bit weak relative to other squads. That keeps them out of the eight for me, and I have them 13th. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just think it's they're one of those teams where there is hope and there is some potential there for them to go higher. Um, but realistically, even if these the teams like the Cowboys and the um, Tigers and, and Warriors, for example, are creeping into the eight, um, they're not going to leave a dent on the premiership. So I, I, I agree with you there. I think the Cowboys sort of fall into that category the 15th team last year the canterbury bulldogs a team everyone is expecting to improve myself included gain Corey allen kyle flanagan nick kotrick Corey waddell and jack hetherington i'll just say i love all of those signings but they lose jack cogger kieran foran carrot holland tim lafay marcelo montoya remy smith aiden tolman and sawaso sue overall I rated them, read their recruitment as an A minus on my post. Um, I think they recruited really, really well, and I think that they've recruited for the future, which is most important. And, and you know, you look at they signed someone like Nick Kotrick, fantastic, will be relevant and will be a great player for the next ten years. Could they have gone and signed someone like a? Um, this is a poor example because they've played there um, previously, like the Morris brothers on a one or two year deal. Yeah, they could have. Would the Morris brothers have had an immediate impact better than Nick Kotrick could? Yeah, probably. But will they get more out of Nick Kotrick on a longer-term deal and start building connections and chemistry to ensure the Bulldogs are relevant and a finals team for the next 10 years? Potentially, yes. Um, How much they improve for me remains to be seen, Jacob, but they, they will improve. I can tell you that much. I mean, last year they won three games. 
I mean, with 25 games this year, it's almost impossible they only win three games. I think they'll probably win triple that, maybe more. Um, So I do think the Bulldogs improved this year, but I do think realistically they are still a bottom eight team. Again, they're one of those teams where even if they somehow manage to slip into the eight, they don't have the experience and the composure to leave any significant din on the competition. Yeah, the, the future is bright with those recruits. And, and the, here's a head coach that I'm bullish on. I saw the improvement in Penrith's attack last year. We know that Baz had a big hand in that. But of course, when a team is just so good in attack, like it's partly coaching, but it's also partly personnel. And, and especially the halves play last year. Was there a better halves combo than Cleary and Luai? So I look at the dogs and I wonder what their level of halves play is going to be. And in general, their attacking potency, which has been their biggest issue in the past. Now, yeah. I like uh, Corey Allen, but I feel like he's a serviceable fullback, not a star. And the, and the gun teams have like that star fullback, whereas I feel like Allen was just chiming in in a well-oiled machine at the Bunnies last year. But still, it's good to bring him in. Um, Kodrick, I think, is a great signing because he's a huge talent. And as you said, all his best footy is still in front of him. I've always loved Wittenis Lesniak, who captained the Maldi side uh, in the Indigenous game. And when it comes to the halves, I love the fact that they're giving Jake Avarillo a crack at six, get his hands on the ball more, use that, that. use that, utilize that speed in, in the middle of the field or, or you know, closer, closer to the ruck. Look, my question mark is Kyle Flanagan, and that's not a knock on him whatsoever. So I, I wasn't critical of him last year, but and, and it could be really good for his development to be handed ownership of this team. It's a theme that we've gone with a few teams of halfbacks being given the ownership sometimes makes them play better. But, you know, like he was playing on such a good team with the Roosters and he, he wasn't, you know, setting the league on fire. I just think, I'm just worried, do we have another Brody Croft scenario? A struggling mm-hmm. team convinces themselves that a young halfback will answer their problems because he was good enough to start for one of the elite teams. But the counter argument is, well, if, if the elite team didn't rate him enough to keep him, how's he going to come and solve all your problems? So... The, obviously, the, uh, the Bulldogs are a much weaker side than the Roosters, let's be totally blunt. So I just hope they give him time and they don't expect to be winning every week. Kind of what you said. Like, let's look towards the future. In a year's time, Ado Carr will be on this team. Matt Burton will Burton. be on this team. So, you know, the future is bright. Funnily enough, a couple of contacts I've got at, at bookmakers have said they've copped some big bets. I'm talking $1,000 plus or even up to $5,000 on the dogs to win the comp at 60, 70 to one, which this I don't year. see this year. Like, and I don't see that whatsoever. I, I've said to those guys that work for those bookies that that's a nice extra bonus for their Christmas party, but mm. I don't see them making the eight, but what I am excited to let alone winning the bloody comp. So I'm not sure what, if people are seeing something that I'm not, but I thought it's worth mentioning if they start gangbusters, maybe there was some secret sauce somebody's seen. But look, I'm just excited to see a little bit more of a skillful brand of footy under Barrett. I have them actually coming same as last year, 15th. Okay, I think that's... uh, uh, Yeah, I could see them coming in the bottom four, but I'd hope that they improve a little bit more than that. But as you say, I'm just not convinced they will. Um, Two things you discussed that I really want to touch on. Jake Avarillo on the six. Love it. Um, I think he won't be there six in 2022, but what he will do is get his hands on the football more, increase his confidence and develop a new set of skills. I'm talking a short kicking game close to the line, something like Will Chambers used to have. Maybe it's increased passing. Maybe it's an offload. Um, He will develop a new set of skills that will be awesome for him when he moves into the centers. And the only really thing I would counter your Kyle Flanagan argument with, and I know you did touch on both sides of the coins there, um, so I will just touch on one of those, is I do think he was overshadowed in the Roosters. And the Roosters have so many veterans and stars that I feel their presence overwhelmed him and overshadowed him and didn't allow him to fully have control and the keys to the ship. At the Bulldogs, as you said, Corey Allen is a serviceable serviceable fullback. Jake Avarillo is not a recognized number six. So the keys go to Kyle Flanagan. This is his chance. He will be playing behind a relatively strong forward pack. I think we would agree. Um, And so no matter what, I think the Bulldogs fans can, can find solace in the fact they will improve this year. And by the time 2022 rolls around, I think you and I could both be predicting them to come into the top eight for our 2022 review. Uh, let's move on to the final team from last year. Um, of course, that was the Brisbane Broncos. They gained John Asiata, Dale Copley, Dale, uh, sorry, 
David Mead, Isaiah Tars, and Albert Kelly and Levo Pulu are on train and trial deals there. So not and Isaac Luke is also sorry, um, and Danny Levi is being looked at. So there's a few players there on the verge of their top thirty, but they do lose Jack Bird, Darius Boyd, David Fafida, Andrew McCulloch, Sean O'Sullivan, and Joe Offerhand Gowie. I, I'm going to be brutally honest here. I do still see the Broncos as a bottom four side. I'm just not sure how much can change in one year. I thought last year they lacked a genuine leader within their spine, and they still have that issue this year because it's not Jermaine Asako. He's not a dominant leader. It's not Anthony Milford. We know that because he's been there since 2014, and then it just, it's just not him. We're now hearing Brody Croft is set to beat Tom Dearden for the seven jersey, which I don't personally agree with, but Brody Croft did, and neither of them are the leader. They did have that leader, though, Jacob, in Andrew McCulloch. They had the veteran that knows the Broncos, that knows the Broncos' success, that knows what it takes to be successful in the NRL, a genuine leader there in the middle, and they got rid of him. So where does that leave them this year? Bottom four for me. I can't see them improving too much. It's a rough take. And, and Broncos fans, because they've had so much success in previous years, I feel like their fan base is deluded, Jacob. I feel like they are optimistic. Well, I mean, but if we look at this club, realistically, what changes? The coach. That's it. Is that enough for me to tell you that they are suddenly going to leapfrog every other team above them on the ladder last year and jump into the eight? It's just not. Could it be? Yeah, maybe. But it's too much of a bold prediction to say so at this stage for myself anyway. As we say, most fan bases are optimistic. But um, I will tell you as well, a lot of Broncos fans are just demoralized after last season. And I'll be mildly controversial here, but before I am... I'll disclose, like, I'm a born and bred Broncos fan, but the tripod followers know I've sacrificed my loyalty and my fanaticism to try and be unbiased. So I've been accused of hating the Broncos, loving them, you know, like, I didn't rate them last year when many others did, but I will say I think they will improve, actually. So let me explain why. Like, I have them actually finishing higher than the Cowboys, the Bulldogs, and the Dragons, and coming 13th, and the reason is... Because I think Kevy will make that big of a difference. Now, why is that? I think he's exactly the type of coach that the doctor has ordered here because it didn't seem like they were playing with that pride for the jersey last year. And I think that if he can just turn around morale and passion alone, I think that's worth multiple ladder spots because of how poor it was last year. Recruitment-wise, very little to speak of, as you touched on. Now, 2020 was an unmitigated disaster. Let's just remember, I know Broncos fans don't want to. Interesting that they're saying Brody Croft might be the starting halfback. But, I mean, and this isn't his fault, but they should never have given him a sizable contract to come up when it was never clear that he was any better than Dearden, who they already had. So there's that part. And now it's, it's funny, like, whoever wins that job. But the point still is they're comparable players. And many will argue Dearden's the better player. So why was Brody Croft brought in on a, on a decent deal again, like trying to be marked as the saviour? Now, and I said this at the time, you know, not just after the fact, losing for feeder, diabolical. I'm not saying the Broncos should have matched that huge salary by the Titans because it was a lot of money. But they just never used to lose players of that calibre Clearly, the toxic culture played a part. What else happened? Katoni Staggs' ACL final game of the season. I mean, that's a catastrophe because now they've lost another superstar, basically for most of this year. There's a third superstar on this team, I think you'd agree, Payne Haas, who's now had disciplinary issues in the offseason and now is suffering a three-match suspension. So, geez, it's been a rough year, although, you know, maybe his indiscretion happened earlier this year, but... That's three superstars you had last year you don't have to kick off season 2021. What a disaster. In saying all that, Fafita was injured part for a bit of last year. Staggs was injured for a bit of last year. Nobody played their best. So I guess they're not losing anybody that were like, you know, dominated for 20 straight weeks. There's there's a huge amount of hype on Jordan Ricky, And from everything I've seen, I think it's warranted. The Ford pack still has Lodge, Flegler, Carrigan, Glenn, TPJ, uh, Oates to the back row. Still a decent pack, and that's why I think just with a culture change, with a bit of pride in the jersey, they always play well at Suncorp. Maybe they get the crowd behind them again. I think Kevy can be the catalyst of a mild improvement, and you don't have to improve much to be better than last year. And that's where I got him just more like 13th rather than on the very you know floor of the cellar. Yeah, spot on. And, and I guess my reasoning why the Broncos could do well this year is Kevin Walters and the cultural reform I was hoping to see. 
But I've got to be honest again, I haven't seen that too much. And my evidence for that is last week after the trial, assistant coach John Cartwright is in a dust up. Some I haven't read the articles because I, I avoid that, but I did see the headline. He was involved in some sort of physical altercation, a bit of a dust up at the pub, not leading by example. Their best player and someone that club legends such as Corey Parker called to be their captain this year, Payne Haas, again, not leading by example with his obvious um, off-field incident that occurred. And so I think when I look at those two things, I, I have to be realistic. Has Kevin Walters really changed the culture yet? I would say no. Well, I guess time will tell. And that's all 16 teams wrapped up. And um, and I said at the start, like many respected rugby league experts who know far more about the game than I ever will, predicted things like Brisbane to finish higher than Penrith last year, and they were wrong by 16 spots. So making preseason predictions is certainly not easy, but that's why we love we love um, the NRL because it's so unpredictable. And I will say as a punter, I can't be married to the predictions that I've given out here. I'm fluid every single week assessing the ability of teams. And there's always the surprise teams and there's always the disappointing teams. We want to identify that early so we can make money. Having said all that, the people are going to want a prediction. Do you have a grand final prediction and a premier's prediction, Clarky? If you give us yours, I'll give you mine. All right. So my grand final, um, I'm going to go with the South Sydney Rabbitohs. I think the Canberra Raiders will be the runner-up, and my Smokey is the Parramatta Reels. The Eels will be my Smokey as well, and I'll include any value uh, players that I've found throughout this pod. Um, I'm going to go grand final rematch. I'm going to say it's Penrith against Melbourne again, and this time I'm going to give the win to the Panthers. Uh, But we'll see how it all uh, unfolds. Thank you so much for all your time on this mega preview of the season with me. Guys, follow Clarky on Facebook and Instagram to help stay across all the happenings of the NRL this season. Also, follow our $1,000 head-to-head tip-off, which will be for charity, and it'll also let you know who our favorite head-to-head pick for the week is based on the odds. Look, Clarky, good luck to you this year for your Titans, and also you personally. I know it's going to be a massive year for you, and hopefully we can have you on the tripod again some stage during the season. Thanks so much, man. Hopefully, for everyone listening, you guys did enjoy our season preview. Again, they're only our opinions and predictions, guys. We won't get them all right, but hopefully we have created some comments and some chat in the comments below. I look forward to seeing you guys throughout the season on Tripod, and um, thanks for having me on, man. I really do appreciate it. So that will do it for our takes on all 16 teams and how we think they're going to go in season 2021, but also what I'm looking for. I'm not obviously declaring that I've got a crystal ball and I know how it's all going to go, but there's certain key positions or key areas, aspects of teams. That's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out earlier in the year because what we're all about, the tripod, is figuring out how good a team is in any given week to see who's going to win and who's going to cover the line, most importantly. Before I go, I do have a special custom-made market that I'm going to share out for the NRL regular season. Here it is. It's 15 to 1, and it's going to be a combination of seven teams. And I think you're going to agree some of these are quite safe, and then there might be one or two that will be in the mix. I think they'll go our way. What I love about a futures bet that's at long odds, you don't have to tie up much money and you get something to cheer for all season long. You've got seven teams here. Whenever any of them are playing, you can be cheering. So my tripod special 2021 regular season multi is the Rabbitoh, Storm and Eels all to make the top eight. You heard about that in my part one a season preview. I've got the Dragons, Bulldogs and Cowboys all missing the top eight. And I've got the West Tigers, who is my kind of dark horse team not to certainly shake up the competition but to exceed expectations and as I spoke about just previously when I talked about them specifically to win over seven and a half games it's paying 15 to one with a max stake of $50 I would have loved to get a max stake even higher than that but Tristan said if you want it let people have even more than that on we may have to lower the odds and I figure for most of us to chuck 50 bucks on something that's 15 to one is enough and it does provide value now you're probably thinking how the hell do I know if that's a good value bet. Well, let me just quickly lay it out for you. Rabbitohs and Storm to make the fi- to make the finals, just to make top eight, right? And Dragons and Bulldogs, who I'm predicting to come 16th and 15th to miss the eight. Those four outcomes, if you multi them together, that's roughly a three to one chance. I think that's going to happen. But if you just say you can multi those four outcomes, that's roughly a one in three. Okay, what about the Eels? They're actually on their own, probably a two in three chance to make the finals in my mind, and like a 1 in 3 chance to miss. Okay, what about the Cowboys? I think they're about the opposite. I think there's like a 1 in 3 chance the Cowboys would make the 8, 
and a 2 and 3 that will be on the right side of that one. If you multiply a 2 in 3 of the Eels and a 2 in 3 of the Cowboys, you get a 4 in 9. It's about a 45% chance. Stay with me. It times that 45% chance by our 1 in 3, and we're right around $6 odds with one leg left, and it's roughly a 50-50, and that is the Tigers to win over seven and a half games, which even if you don't agree with my handicap that it's great value, and you want to say it's 50-50, let's double those $6 odds. This should, for me, pay around the $12 mark if I didn't already lean and think any of those particular legs were value, which I do, especially the Tigers. The extra little bit of secret sauce in this one is the Tigers play Dragons, Cowboys, and Bulldogs twice, each of them. So there's more opportunities to jack, jag some wins in those games and help those sides on their way to not making the eight. That's why I think $15 is really good value, something fun to ride all season long. You guys will have actually seen in the tripod group, just exclusively in our group, there's an opportunity for you guys to create your own multis like this as well. And Top Sport will price them up for you. And if you like the odds they're offering you, you can jump on. And there's a number of reasons why you won't get a better price doing it this way than you will with the other bookies who only let you multi all teams to make it. And you're actually betting against yourself the more teams you bet to make it. So here we've got three in, three out, and Tigers to have a little bit better year than expected. 15 to 1. If you need to join Top Sport, I've got a promo code you can join with Tripod, T-R-Y-P-O-D. That will do it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed our two-part season preview. Thank you again to Clarky. Uh, what I really want to welcome is your comments, your predictions. What did we say that you totally disagree with? You know, stamp your territory, plant your flag, let us know what you reckon or what you agree with as well. And let's look forward to a super exciting 2021. I'm going to be giving it everything I've got to make it the best possible season for people who follow the tripod. And there's so many other great blokes and great minds in there that are going to be contributing as well. And while I am doing the pod on my own this season, I'm going to bring in a lot of sharp minds and a lot of different voices as well from time to time to give you additional insight and help us enjoy this season as much as we can. So I'll see you in six days' time when we preview round one. As always, gamble responsibly. Lego!